our, our first speaker this morning, I have to tell you something. I first met Claire when she was a mere child and a summer student in our lab at Jackson Laboratory. And believe it or not, it was 45 years ago. <laughs> and, and so she has been um, with the Alstrom syndrome cause since the beginning. And we love her, and she's um, going to tell us about optimal nutrition for optimal health, which I think we all need. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. It's such a great pleasure and privilege to be with all of you here today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, how to optimize nutrition for optimal health. I must say ahead of time that these guidelines are guidelines for people uh, in general. They haven't been developed specifically for people with Alstrom syndrome. And I, I would propose that one of the things that we really need to look at when we're thinking about research priorities is to think about how these various nutritional interventions that we know work very well for people with average metabolism how they impact people with Alstrom syndrome, because we, we don't know the answer to that question right now. So <clears throat> we all have certain expectations of aging. And I have to apologize in advance. I, I take Dr. Levin's uh, comments yesterday very seriously. And I apologize to those of you who can't see that these slides are um, up here and you're not able to to see what's on them. So I'll do my best to describe what uh, we have. I don't have too many pictures. Mostly I'm just saying what the words are that are on the slides. But um, these pictures uh, depict sort of what, what the trajectory is through life. Of You know, we start off crawling, and we get into middle age, and we're fit. And then we gradually lose mobility and start experiencing pain as we get older. And there's pretty good evidence now that by optimizing our nutrition that we can fend off some of those degenerative diseases of aging and that certain uh, nutritional interventions can actually make us feel better and more alert and energetic as we go through life. And there are two very important processes that take place at, during the aging process. And one of these is oxidative stress or free radical damage. You've probably heard those terms before. And the second one is inflammation. And these two phenomenon are related to each other. So when we think about inflammation, when I learned about inflammation in medical school, I learned these four Latin words that characterize inflammation. Dolor is pain. Calor is heat or warmth. Tumor or swelling. And rubor or redness. So you know, when you have inflammation, typically, it's, especially if it's an acute inflammatory process, it hurts. It becomes red, it gets swollen and uh, warm. And eventually what happens is, you know, you have, this is a picture that shows these, these four columns of inflammation holding up the roof. But eventually what happens if there's more and more inflammation that you actually lose function. And we know that inflammation actually underlies many, many of the degenerative diseases of aging. And this includes type 2 diabetes. It includes Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease. There's good evidence that cancer, some cancers, uh, are promoted by inflammation, pulmonary diseases, neurologic diseases, problems with the autoimmune uh, phenomena, and uh, arthritis. Even what we call the wear and tear arthritis, which is not typically thought of as an inflammatory process, does have some element of inflammation involved in it. And the more inflammation there is, the more pain there is, and the more loss of function. Now, when we think about the free radicals, um, 
Free radicals are everywhere in our environment, and they're caused by things like ionizing radiation, by smoking, by air pollution, and by inflammation. Um, just the regular process of metabolism in our bodies, you know, we have those powerhouses in each of our cells that are called the mitochondria, and they generate free radicals. So free radicals are everywhere. And when we think about free radicals, we think about um, what we can do to minimize the damage of those free radicals, and those uh, nutritional um, supplements are called antioxidants. And the, we think about oxidation as kind of the rust in the biological system. You know, when you leave a bicycle out in the rain, the, the fender starts to rust. Um, but we can also see the evidence of oxidation if you cut an apple and it starts to get brown on the inside, that is evidence of oxidation. And traditionally, we defined the process of oxidation as the interaction between oxygen molecules and all the different substances that they might interact with. But now we think of it in terms of, of the subatomic particles of the electrons in, um, in the, in the uh, material that you lose one electron and then you get the process of oxidation. So these two processes, the two substances that interact in the process of oxidation don't necessarily have to include oxygen. But if one substance loses an electron and the other one gains it, the one that has lost that electron undergoes the process of oxidation. And uh, this uh, diagram shows that process. So the electrons really, they're kind of like people. They prefer to be in pairs. They're happier when they're in pairs. And if one pair of electrons loses its mate, then it's going to go out scavenging and looking for another electron to make that pair whole again. I think of it like um, uh, uh, if you think about a dance, and they're all couples dancing together, and then one person cuts in on the couple, and that leaves somebody without a partner, then that partner is going to go look for somebody else to dance with. But if you bring in a whole bunch of extra people to, to the dance, then, you know, there'll be more, more possibilities, more possibilities for partners. And basically, that's what the antioxidants do, is they bring in electron donors to fill in those gaps with the unpaired electrons, and they serve to quench the free radical damage. So when we look at the disorders that have been associated with free radical oxidative stress, it's very similar to the list of disorders that are associated with inflammation. We see uh, disorders in the brain, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Cancer of the brain has been associated with free radical damage. There are ocular problems like macular degeneration and retinal degeneration that are associated with free radical damage. A lot of the cardiovascular diseases that are associated with aging are also associated with free radical stress. So um, cardiovascular disease that leads to heart attacks and stroke, atherosclerosis, and all of these things are, are associated with free radical damage. And there are multiple diseases of aging in the kidney, in the skin, in the joints, the blood vessels, the lungs, that are all associated with free radical stress. So this slide just illustrates that the free radical stress and the chronic inflammation stress really overlap with each other. And I apologize, these are kind of small. So nobody can see them, just for, for those people who have no sight. The rest of us who are sighted can't read this one either. Um, 
the point of it is, though, that the infl inflammatory diseases and the free radical diseases overlap with each other, and they involve pretty much every organ system in the body. So that if we can quench the inflammation, if we have a diet that decreases inflammation and decreases free radical stress, we can minimize our risk of developing these chronic degenerative diseases as we age. So what does an anti-inflammatory diet look like? It has lots and lots of phytonutrients, what we call the, the, these are the chemicals that are found in plants, in fruits, in vegetables, in grains, beans, spices, and herbs. And um, we have a very wide color palette in our food when we're eating an anti-inflammatory diet. And all those different colors of the rainbow represent these different phytochemicals that are really good at fighting inflammation and quenching that oxidative stress. The spices and herbs that do a really good job at this are turmeric, curry, nutmeg, cinnamon, cayenne pepper, garlic, oregano, rosemary, and ginger. Vitamin C and E are particularly good at anti-inflammatory properties, and magnesium is also really very, very important um, in this process. Other foods that are, are really good for an anti-inflammatory diet include beans and whole grains, spinach, nuts, and bananas. I'd like to say just a little word about turmeric because this is just an amazing thing that I've just learned about relatively recently. Um, turmeric is also uh, called curcumin. You may have heard about it, and it's nature's anti, it's really nature's anti-inflammatory. It's like, have you heard about the COX-2 inhibitors? Uh, Celebrex and meloxicam, all of those drugs inhibit um, a molecule called COX-2. And one of the things that we worry about with those COX-2 inhibitors, there have been studies over the last couple of years that have shown that if people take them for too long, they increase their risk of heart attack. But turmeric is actually nature's own COX-2 inhibitor. And so without the side effects that you get from the pharmacological COX-2 inhibitors, you can decrease your inflammation by using turmeric. So that's a really uh, very, very interesting um, piece of information that I learned just in the last couple of months. So this slide shows a Healing Foods Pyramid from the University of Michigan Integrative Medicine. And it's a very different pyramid from the traditional food pyramid that we've seen from the federal government and other uh, so-called experts over the years. Um, one thing I'd like to point out to you is that at the very base of this pyramid is water. And um, the bottom, I would say two-thirds of the pyramid describe those foods that we should be eating daily. And the ones up towards the top uh, are supposed to be eaten just weekly. And then the accompaniments at the very top of the pyramid are strictly optional. So the things that we should have daily are the fruits and vegetables, grains, legumes, healthy fats. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. And um, this pyramid includes eggs and dairy in this, in this daily list. And fish and meats are in the weekly category. So the suggestion from this pyramid is to minimize the amount of animal protein. And then up at the very top are the things like sugars and um, sodas and things like that, which really uh, do not contribute to overall health in any way. So coming back to the question about the water, this is really, really important, and I think it's something that's under-recognized by many people. The human body is 57 to 60 percent water, 
And adequate hydration is really key to many different processes in the body. It's necessary for maintaining good blood pressure, good kidney function, and adequate circulation to all the different parts of the body. So uh, we actually recommend that you should be drinking about half your body weight in pounds. If you take your body weight in pounds, divide it by two, that's the number of ounces of water that you should be drinking every day. Now I tried to make, to convert this calculation to um, kilograms and milliliters or liters, and I didn't really come up with a good formula, so I'll have to, we'll have to get some of our IT people here to help me with that. Um, I, if a 45 kilogram person should be drinking about one and a half liters of water a day. So that, that's kind of how the calculation worked out, but it's not an easy just divide it by two and that's the number in ounces. So um, this comes back to the antioxidants that are found in the colorful fruits and vegetables. And these are polyphenols, they're water soluble antioxidants and these are the blues, greens and purples. So the berries, uh, fruits um, that include berries, leafy green vegetables, and green tea and red wine, also excellent sources. Jan, take note. <laughs> so um, the benefits of eating uh, antioxidant-rich foods, we, get, we support our kidney function, we maintain good dental health, the nervous system has better, uh, better functioning, it improves reproductive functioning and the functioning of the immune system. And it offers protection against digestive disorders. So finding those really good, rich antioxidant foods, and basically that means just keeping a really good color palette on your plate, thinking about having a plate that has three or four different colors of foods with every meal will pretty much accomplish that. And these are the flavonoids. Um, the, this slide shows the chemical composition of the flavonoids. And uh, for those of you who never took organic chemistry, uh, this will look a little strange, but these molecules have a lot of double bonds. And that means that they're able to contribute electrons, so they have extra electrons floating around, and that's what makes them good antioxidants. And this slide shows the effects of these polyphenols in the body. They have antioxidant effects, anti-inflammatory effects. They prevent proliferation of the cells, so this means that if there is a cell that's sort of tending towards uh, overgrowth, and that would be a, pr a precursor to cancer, these, pro these molecules have anti-proliferative effects. They have anti-thrombotic effects, and that means that the, they, they um, inhibit the function of the platelets in causing clots. So there, you're gonna have less likelihood of developing a blood clot either in the venous system or in the arteries, decrease the risk of heart attack and stroke, as well as deep venous thrombosis. They help to relax the blood vessels and therefore moderate the blood pressure. And they also have anti-angiogenic effects. So that means that they decrease the effects of the ability of the body to build new blood vessels, which is a really, that anti-angiogenic effect is an important protection against cancer. Blueberries, especially the wild blueberry, are probably the most um, antioxidant-rich fruits out there. So using blueberries in a, as a daily serving in your either breakfast or in a smoothie for breakfast is a really good way of getting those antioxidants in. Now, uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the omega-3 fatty acids. These molecules short-circuit in inflammation and lead to less oxidative stress. And it's been shown in many, many different studies that people who have, um, who are taking adequate omega-3 fatty acids and also regular exercise 
and anti-inflammatories have improved cognition as they age. And people who do not do those things, who have a sedentary lifestyle and a poor diet, are they're more likely to have problems with their cognition as they age. So those omega-3 fatty acids play a very important role in enhancing circulation and in cardiovascular disease. Now we know that cardiovascular disease causes 38% of all deaths in the United States. And this is, again, I'm talking about average people without Ostrom syndrome, okay? So um, we don't know whether the use of omega-3 fatty acids is going to help with the cardiovascular risk in Ostrom syndrome or not. But the chronic inflammation that plays a really important role in cardiovascular disease is ameliorated or helped by the EPA and DHA, which are the omega-3 fatty acids. And it's actually been shown that these omega-3s decrease the genes, the expression of the genes that are involved in inflammation. So the, and the omega-3s actually work ag um, against platelet aggregation also. So they decrease uh, platelet aggregation and they enhance the circulation of the blood. So we know that they, get, they provide cardiovascular protection to the average person out there. Um, they reduce the risk of recurrent coronary artery disease. They reduce heart failure events. And um, even in people who are taking statins to reduce their lipids, um, they will get an additional benefit from taking omega-3 fatty acids. In people with impaired glucose metabolism, the use of omega-3 fatty acids actually reduced the risk of coronary events by 22%. So that's a significant benefit. Here again, in average people, by increasing your, your blood omega-3 levels, you can reduce the relative risk of having a sudden cardiac death by 90%. This is very, very dramatic. And when we look at the role in uh, peripheral arterial disease and atherosclerosis, the omega-3s reduce, they improve the stability of plaque so that means that the plaque is less likely to break off and go into the uh, coronary arteries or cause a stroke. They decrease the endothelial activation, which is a way of the endothelial activation causes inflammation. And all of these phenomena altogether reduce the chances of a cardiovascular event like heart attack or stroke. I'm going to skip over this. So. For average people, the American Heart Association recommends increased oily fish intake and the use of omega-3 fatty acids for primary and secondary prevention of coronary artery disease. And there are many mechanisms that underlie this protective effect, but it's important to know that Persons with Ostrom syndrome really should monitor their blood lipid levels when they're taking any omega-3 supplementation because we heard yesterday from Bob Schemberich that um, it, these omega-3s, we're not sure what the impact is going to be of the omega-3s in persons with Ostrom syndrome. So that's something that we really need to know. Now, the um, omega-3s, one of the mechanisms by which they work is they protect the telomeres in our cells. And this is a picture of the chromosomes in the, in the cell. And the telomeres are the caps on the ends of the chromosomes. Those telomeres are really important for protecting uh, the DNA in our cells. And as we age, the telomere length goes down. When, when you look at cells that are growing in culture, as those cells age, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually, as they get to the really bottom of the, the smallest size, then the cells are no longer able, able to divide. 
So telomere shortening is associated with low omega-3 fatty acid levels. So people who have the lowest omega-3 fatty acid levels have the shortest telomeres. And we would like to support our telomeres as much as possible. So this is another reason for uh, supplementing with EPA and EHA, which are the omega-3 fatty acids. And it has been shown, uh, this, this slide shows that it, as this person was aging, their telomeres were getting shorter, and then they made a change in their diet that increased the number of, uh, the amount of omega-3 fatty acids, and the telomere length can then start to increase. So this is a list of nutrients that are known to protect the telomeres, and it includes vitamin D. Now, I haven't mentioned vitamin D so far, but this is another nutrient that's really, really important to monitor because we know that people with lower vitamin D levels are going to be at increased risk of osteoporosis, and they're going to experience greater amounts of pain. If we can enhance our, our levels of vitamin D, we can, get, um, we can really improve the quality of life for many people. The recommended level for vitamin D is, should be somewhere between 40 and 50. Now, when you look at the, the normal range in an average laboratory, in the US, a lot of times the labs will say 20 to 100 is the normal range but we really like to get it up to between 40 and 50. And um, there's very good data that says that people with vitamin D levels in that range will experience uh, less pain. And then the astaxanthins, are, those are um, very good uh, anti-inflammatory and antioxidants, the omega-3 fatty acids, CoQ10, You've probably heard about probiotics and the polyphenols that I mentioned. Uh, the vitamin Bs are really important, vitamin A and K, and magnesium, as well as the curcumin. So there's a long list of nutrients that will help to protect the telomeres, and not coincidentally, these all have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant uh, effects. The last thing I'd like to mention is the benefits of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas, and this gas is it com it's composed of one molecule of nitrogen and one molecule of oxygen. And it circulates in the body in a similar way to the way oxygen circulates. It's attached to hemoglobin. And nitric oxide increases our metabolic rate. It promotes wound healing. It reduces pain. It encourages lung health and immune health. It improves digestion, provides restful sleep, and also helps to maintain healthy blood sugar levels. So anything that we can do with our diet to enhance the production of nitric oxide is going to have benefits in multiple different areas of health. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just skip over that slide, but. The way that we enhance nitric oxide production is to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. People who uh, consume the Mediterranean diet, which is really high in fruits and vegetables, have higher levels of nitric oxide. Beets are particularly great, and they're very high in the nitrates and nitrites, which are the precursors to nitric oxide. They're converted to nitric oxide very readily. Noni fruit is another fruit that's really, really good for uh, converting into nitric oxide and enhancing the levels of nitric oxide in the blood. And as I mentioned, the Mediterranean diet, which is high in fruits and vegetables and fish with the omega-3 fatty acids, is another good way to enhance nitric oxide production. So, in summary, we want to make sure we're getting the recommended daily allowance of vitamins, both the water and fat soluble vitamins. You want to ensure adequate hydration every day. The omega-3 fatty acids, they will help with inflammation, but persons with Alstrom syndrome should keep watch on their lipid profile. 
and fruits and vegetables will help enhance nitric oxide production to optimize blood circulation and the delivery of all of these great nutrients that you're taking in in your diet to every cell in the body. And then of course, optimal glucose control is key to minimizing the risks uh, from diabetes. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, raise your hand and I'll bring a mic to you. I'm going to go in closest order, but I see it. Well, I was just wondering, um, I keep a lot of frozen fruits because it's just plain old easier <laughs> than, than, I'm not skilled, real skilled at cutting. I mean, you know, I can cut, but it's, it's, just, it's just more of a hassle than it is. So I just get the frozen fruits and keep them in the freezer, and then we take them down and we eat them. <laughs> frozen? I mean, it's, it's really good. Just let them fall out a little bit and just eat them. Blueberries, strawberries, bananas, you know, it's a, kind of like a medley mix. So that, that's a really great strategy, I think. The frozen uh, fruits maintain their nutritional integrity, and um, they're actually much better than the canned varieties. So if, that's what I was if, going to ask, yes. If you're, not going to, um, if you're not going to use the fresh ones, the frozen ones are definitely a very close second best. Although I, I use, I have used the essential oils, like the lemon, and I put lemon on fish sometimes, and they're a good season, you know, for seasoning, you know, and, and then I diffuse them. So I've used essential oils that came from an organic farm, so, and I've used those recently. So, I don't know. Yes, though, that's another very good way of getting your, um, the antioxidants in from the essential oils. Is it possible to have a copy, a hard copy of your presentation so that we can go over it with our people from France? Absolutely. Jan, we can print one out here and get it to you, sure. Yes. Did, did I understand correctly that meat and fish should be eaten only weekly, once a week? So, you know, this is, there are so many different diet recommendations out there, and it's really very difficult, uh, even as a professional and somebody who does a lot of reading about these things. Um, I, I haven't come to a final kind of decision in my own mind about these recommendations, but I think that minimizing the animal protein actually makes sense from a lot of different perspectives. Um, for, from the, the uh, health of the planet, even, and to the fact that the animal protein, um, particularly uh, beef and pork, is very high in the inflammatory uh, fatty acids. You know, the omega-3s are the anti-inflammatory ones. The omega-6s and 9s are pro-inflammatory. They encourage inflammation. So by decreasing the amount of, of beef and pork that you're taking in, you can uh, decrease that inflammatory effect of the diet. So I do think that it, it makes sense to try to decrease the amount of beef and pork that we take in. I'm, I'm still kind of up in the air in my own mind about the fish and, and poultry. So uh, meat does not include white meat, huh? uh, uh, like chi is chicken included in, in meat? Yeah, so the chicken, chicken has less of the inflammatory molecules in it. So I think that I don't, in my own thinking and my own diet and when I talk to my own patients, I don't discourage them from using chicken and turkey, um, but I do discourage the, the use of the uh, beef products, the red meat. Can you, can you explain to us the omega-3 fishes, what, 
Can you uh, make a three? Uh, if I understand right, some oh, so fishes. Which omega fishes? So yeah. So the the fishes that are very rich in omega threes are the are the fishes that we consider to be more of the fatty fishes. Salmon, in particular, is really excellent. But in term, when you're thinking about the salmon, the, I've been reading le lately that we have to be careful to avoid the farmed salmon. You want the, the salmon that's fresh caught, you know, out in the wild rather than the, uh, the farmed salmon because they're, the farmed salmon is being fed a lot of grains and um, it's not as good for us. Expensive one. Yeah, unfortunately. <sighs> Thank you. I had a couple of comments and a question. The question slips my mind right now, but hopefully I'll remember it while I'm making the comments. One thing I didn't hear in your in your one thing I didn't hear in your presentation was about sources. I know that, for instance, you mentioned that but that vitamin D is important, but I didn't hear anything about how to get vitamin D. For it, I know that t t I know that according to the reports that I've seen, 10 minutes in the sun in, with no sunscreen in shorts and a tank top will create up to 10,000 international units of uh, vitamin D in the in the body, which is then metabolized into the bloodstream and transferred throughout the body. It's generated in the skin when exposed to, to UVB rays, ultra, ultraviolet light B. Yes. That I didn't hear, but I didn't hear anything about any sources, and I know, and I know that bioavailability is an issue. That we we don't get our bodies don't process the the nutrients out of some things as well as they do others. Now this I'm quoting my dietitian here, but she but according to her I, I'll actually get more omega-3s out of a handful of walnuts than I will out of two, out of two fish oil capsules. That, how, I, w I was wondering if you could comment on, on availability, of bioavailability and, and sources of, of the nutrients you're talking about. So that's a really important question and I thank you, thank you for bringing it up. Um, and a lot of people who have digestive issues actually have problems with the absorption and particularly with re as it relates to vitamin D. Um, definitely the sun is a great source, but many people don't get enough time in the sun without the sunscreen and out there, you know. And um, we can definitely make an effort to do that. But um, there are dairy sources that are supplemented with vitamin D. Most people who have really low vitamin D levels are not gonna get their vitamin D into that 40 to 50 range without some supplementation. Uh, and there, there are some products that have drops. I, in particular, there's a company called Biotics Research that makes a, a, an emulsion that has 2,000 international units of vitamin D in each drop. So you put uh, you know, you can just titrate the amount of vitamin D that you take until you get to that uh, level between 40 and 50. And to me, that's the easiest way. It's but very bioavailable. Your stomach doesn't have to break it down. It's absorbed really readily into the, into the bloodstream. You're absolutely right about the walnuts and omega-3s. That's a very good source of omega-3s. Um, and I would just really like to encourage people to pay very close attention to what uh, Bob Shamburek said yesterday, um, because I, we don't want to be encouraging people to take the omega-3s and then get into trouble with more of the lipids. So that's something that we need to know more about. In my own independent research, I found a lot of positive information regarding coconut oil. What would you say about that? So coconut oil um, is, a, is an excellent source of, uh, it's, it's a very um, low inflammatory oil, a good source of, um, oh, uh, it doesn't have omega-3s in it, I don't believe, but it doesn't have any of the pro-inflammatory um, 
oils or uh, what are they called? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word. But anyway, the um, the the a coconut oil is a really good source of uh, oil for people who are trying to reduce inflammation in their diet. Are there any other questions? I'll be here until midday tomorrow, and I'll be happy to talk with anybody if you have specific questions for me. Thank you so much.